welcome to Alternative Andalusia, where we explore the more spiritual and holistic attractions that this region has to offer. In this program, we shall be looking at eco-friendly building techniques, as well as the rise in popularity of organic farming. On today's show, I'll be meeting with Carl and Patricia, who have built their own eco-friendly house from scratch. They will show me around and explain what inspired them to live this way. Then I head off to Sierra de las Nieves to meet John Ryan, who is building his own home using the resources around him. I get my hands dirty as John shows me how to build a house out of mud. Later in the show, I will be visiting an organic farm and helping to harvest the olive crop before talking with Andy and Carol about their life as farmers. Before finally meeting Mike Slaughter, who is currently in the process of building his own organic supermarket. Here in rural Andalusia, many people have been able to realise their dreams of living a more eco-sustainable lifestyle. They believe that it's important that people start taking responsibility for their environment, and the best place to start is at home. I've come to see Mikhail and Patricia, who live a few miles inland from Malaga. They've built their own house from scratch on a mountain the locals have lovingly called Magic Mountain. They've paid a lot of attention to making it eco-friendly, so I wanted to find out exactly what they've done. Michael and Patricia, thank you for inviting us to your beautiful home. Now, I understand that you were one of the first people to build an eco-friendly house on this mountain, known as Magic Mountain. How did it all begin? Well, five years ago, we found this beautiful piece of land and we walked around it, looked at the olive trees and the pine trees. And then this particular olive tree spoke to us. And we started calling her Grandmother Olive Tree. She has got she, some massive olives up there, hasn't she? she really still huge has. ones. Yes, yes, we've picked most of them, but a few we've left for her. And in fact, the tree is decorated because we wanted to thank her for the olive harvest that we've just had. And we loved this tree so much when we first came here that we sat underneath her for a long time, actually meditating and asking her, should we actually build a house on this beautiful piece of land? Would it spoil the land to do that? We wanted to make a small footprint on the land and keep its beauty. And in the end, um, grandmother said to us, yes, it's okay. And so we started building around her. The architect drew up the plans using this tree as the central focus for all the measurements of the house. Oh, that's wonderful. So really, this is the centre. Sort of, you know, yes. Some houses, they might say the, the hearth, the fire, is the centre of the home. But here it is actually the olive tree. It is. Oh, she yes. is absolutely beautiful. So where did you go from here? Uh, having got the architect and the plans approved, we started building and we've got photographs of the lines of sand marked out on the ground for the shape of the house. And then we had a good team of builders who helped us with the design and the building of it. Now, was it, um, was it a sort of straightforward vision of how you wanted the house? I mean, obviously you got an architect involved. Did, did you find there was any conflict of their vision and yours? No, we worked very harmoniously with him, but we had the environmental idea. Mikhail and Patricia were keen to show me what eco-facilities their house had to offer. Now when building your own house in a location like this, one thing you've got to remember is that there are no services. That's no electricity or running water. You have to generate it all yourself. So Mikhail and Patricia have installed solar panels and a wind turbine to generate electricity. We're here from the mountains particularly at certain times of the year, there is an enormous wind that hurtles through here. Gosh. And that actually gener generates in itself um, an enormous backup of electricity, which often is useful when the sun is not shining, the wind is certainly blowing. One of the things I was interested in seeing was their composting toilet. The idea of growing your own vegetables fertilized with your own waste seemed a bit off-putting to me, but it is very eco-friendly. The principle being that with the, um, with the human waste, um, it should be um, able to be put back with no pathogens back onto the land. It takes about a year for your own waste to become actual fertilizer, so it has to sit around for a bit. 
It's a really good idea, but I'm not too sure about this toilet seat. One of the greatest necessities in Spain with its long, hot, dry summers is water. An average family can get through up to 1,500 litres of water a week, so it's very important to ensure that you have a good supply. So what have we got here? Well, this is part of our rainwater harvesting system. If you have a look inside... Wow! <laughs> it's full of water. <laughs> it is. That's brilliant. So, um, so how does it all work? Well, when we decided to put in the rainwater harvesting system, we looked at the rainfall figures for this region over 16 years and calculated the amount of storage we would need to last us through an average year. And we have five roofs and we put wide gutters onto each roof and a storage tank like this holding 2,000 litres uh, for each roof. Then this water gets pumped up the hill to a very large collection tank where it stays and then when we want to use the water it comes down by gravity and comes down through two filters so the water that comes out of our tap is very clean. Another key principle in eco-design is using reclaimed materials and Mikhail's really pleased with some of the features that he's found which really add character to the house. So Michael, tell me about this gorgeous door. Well, it is a recycled door. Admittedly, we, um, we did buy this one um, at quite a reasonable price, but it's an example of much of the recycling which is worth following up. Uh, for anyone who's considering building, uh, particularly building a new home. Most of our doors and windows we've found either in trash bins, skips or whatever, um, got them cleaned up, planed down and look like new. The important essence of it is that these old doors and old frames are made of a good timber which is well seasoned, whereas all the modern stuff that's being turned out these days is made mainly from northern European pine which warps and twists in the heat of the Andalusian summer particularly. Well it certainly is a fantastic asset to the house. <laughs> What attracted you to this region of Andalusia? I think the beauty of the mountains. Um, always so fresh and bright, and sometimes we're in the sunshine and the village below is in the mist. Other times we're in the mist and the village is in the sunshine. It's always changing. Oh, how magical. It's a little bit like a sort of Avalon kind yes. of thing. <laughs> and and yes. for me, um, it's been a long-standing attraction to come to Andalus, uh, which in a very traditional ancient meaning is andar walk, Latin walk means light, to walk in the light. And this wonderful land has attracted so many inspirational artists, poets, uh, writers, um, because of the particular qualities, the essences that are in this land. So we've seen how you can create electricity by using solar power and also wind power. And we've also seen how you can harvest rainwater. But what about the building materials that you use to actually build your house with? How can you make sure that they're also eco-friendly? To find out more, I came to Sierra de las Nieves to meet eco-builder John Ryan. Big. I can see behind us we've got this most beautiful structure that you, you've built here and even the way you've put the windows in just sort of surrounded by sort of natural clay. Um, did you take a lot, are these techniques that you've learned from someone else or are you just making them up yourself, you're learning, you're creating them? Well yeah I'm learning, I'm learning to work with the earth and what's around me and trying to build a shelter, something that's nice and warm, um, do as cheaply as possible but but um, make it maybe possibly even better than what you think yeah. you can buy. Yeah. And what is it that has inspired you to come to this region of Andalusia? Well, I suppose being able to do this, for one, because you can't do it everywhere. So do you have any electricity up here? No. So how do you power up your mobile phone? Well, I have a little solar panel and I have a little battery. And then, of course, a lot of things that I've done, I've had friends in the village because it wouldn't be possible, I don't think, for me to have had the comfort that I've had and do have. But I've been able, I can go down to a bar and just, not a problem over here. Yeah, you want a bit of electricity, just plug in. 
Now with this building behind us, I can see that some of the walls are made out of straw bales and some of them are made out of clay. <laughs> um, what happens when it rains? Does the clay not go back to mud? But when you get ordinary clay and you knead it, you take the air out of it, so you're actually creating another thing, a bit like alchemy really, you're creating it from the same substance, squeezing it, taking the air out, and then when that gets hard, it doesn't actually get wet right through and fall away like clay. It just gets wet but then dries out. John feels that I would have a better understanding of how his house is built if he got me working on it with him. So he's given me a pair of gloves and has put me to work preparing a mixture of gravel, sand and straw, which is known as cob. First of all, I need to sift, sift this earth here so that we get rid of any rocks and extra bits and pieces that we don't really want in there. And as you can see, there's quite a lot of large lumps here. But what we end up with is a nice, fine, fine earth here. If you sift in the same amount of sand okay. with it. So it's a bit like cooking, really. So you spray it and those particles start to bring themselves together. Okay. So you've got something now that when you when you do that, it squeezes up, yeah. right? It squeezes. It That's does, the clay. Wow. You take a bit of straw, right? Okay. Good. It's, it's gonna make carb actually. Yeah, this was what gets a lot of strength, doesn't it? And, now, and what kind of shape do you want me to make it into? You want to put, put a bit on the window. Yeah. You remember the window? Yeah. Thing? Now. Oh. Cool, it's hard work. Has it been a lifelong dream to be able to sort of follow this more eco-friendly lifestyle? Certainly, to, be, to, to go back to being a bit of a child is a great Thing. And you can just be like a kid camping, mess around in mud. Like just give you a little, a little tiny bit yeah. of wet now. There we go. If you put a blend in again. Yeah. Let's go, let's go. That's okay. That's very good. Is that alright? Yeah, because sometimes even just one push down. And then you come back to it because yeah. this is what you learn about it. You pull it in and then you work your way back. Come okay. back a half an hour later and you can work with it better. Oh, it yeah. doesn't matter. You can actually squash it right in. And then we, we get another bit. Squash. Another bit there. There. And then before you know it, you've got something that you can start to work quite good with. And so you've made this entire house this way, haven't you? Look at this. All these walls are all cob out there, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. They're all, yeah. So do you regard this as a more spiritual way of life? No, 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 because there is no spiritual way of life. You know, you know, you know life is life. Spiritual, this, that, that we've created. Life is just life. You can do it anywhere. And the most important thing is that you can do it anywhere because there is no place you can do it. That it doesn't exist. When you can do it within yourself, it's maybe possible to enjoy the pleasure of everything else. But you, nothing, nothing gives you that. Nothing. Now, what's your vision for the future? <laughs> to live. <laughs> what's the vision for I, I suppose it would be nice to think that, that, that there would be a place here that I could enjoy maybe my, some more my family or my grandchildren when I'm older, to just, just be able to have a big food, you know, like, uh, you know, thing and enjoy here for a while. But there again, to be honest with you, if it all went tomorrow, as long as I'm waking up, I'm feeling reasonably sane in my mind, I think I'm lucky. And, I, I, and it's not, I'm not going to try and get attached to the place. Uh, but having said that, you know what I mean, I want to be natural too. I want to feel all the things you should feel, the disappointments and the happiness. I, I, I don't want to be kind of just zombie-like, you know. So we've seen how eco-building can be both practical and beautiful. Join us in part two as we look at the rising popularity of organic farming here in Andalusia.
Are your investments stuck in the past? Langtons offer a free review of your finances. For insured and qualified advice, call 900 800 Are you looking and from from the is growing there's wooden caned beds, romantic Victorian hand forged bedsteads. British beds in Europe deliver sheer poetry into your Spanish bedroom. Welcome back to Alternative Andalusia. In part one, we looked at ways of greening our houses through ecological building techniques. Now we're going to look at organic farming and the importance of the food that we eat. With such a high demand for healthy food these days, it's not surprising that a lot of people in Andalusia are now growing their own organic produce. To find out how to live self-sufficiently, I travel to the Alpajaras to meet Andy and Carol, two expats who have created their own version of the good life. So tell me, how long have you been here? And what's been the ethos and the motive behind um, setting up this wonderful farm? Well, we, we first came about 15 years ago. Uh, and the idea was to come uh, and live as much uh, self-sufficiently as possible. We've been growing our vegetables enough for ourselves. We have goats, we have chickens. Um, and what's happened is we were able to acquire a bit more land. So uh, we've been able to grow excess food, um, which enables us now to sell at the market or to swap for other goods with local people. Now, what drew you to this region of Andalusia? Um, well, we, we, we were drawn to Spain, essentially, and we've tried all sorts of other places before we came down here. And when we saw this cortijo... We knew. We knew. We knew this was it. So, so would your ideal aim be to make enough money from selling the excess produce to buy anything you need? Yes. Yes. In a word. That would be the idea. Andy and Carol produce all their own organic food here. Jams, salads, eggs, bread and cheese. One of the things they are known for is their extra virgin olive oil, which is produced from the olives growing on their farm. It's now time to harvest more olives, which is done using the traditional method of bashing the tree with a large stick. And they've asked me to give them a hand. Down onto the neck. All this work just for some olive oil. <laughs> the oil is squeezed from these olives using a cold press, and Andy and Carol take their olives to a local olive press in order to extract the oil from them. Now this is the finished product here. That looks gorgeous and it's, it's so rich and green as well. Mm. So that's extra virgin, is that's it? That's right, cold pressed. Cold pressed, mm -hmm. fantastic. Now you've got all these wonderful products mm -hmm. here. Um, can you tell me who you sell to? Um, so we sell to people who walk up and down. The, um, we have a pregnancy class that takes place just up the way, so people buy when they come past. People who have known us before when we used to do markets come and buy from especially, especially the salads, which are quite unusual. Um, and people can't get it anywhere else, so they come to us. Now, I understand also that there's a local restaurant that seems to have uh, cornered the market with you, and you do deliver to Al Limone, is that right? Yes, that's right. We deliver salads, um, Rocket in particular. The rocket is picked by hand and then quickly packed and delivered to El Limonero, a nearby restaurant in Orgiva. Andy and Carol's organic food is very popular and I heard a rumour that they had a secret ally helping them to produce the tastiest food in town, the moon. So what role does the moon play when you're farming? Um, well, generally, when I'm using the moon for, um, for, for the um, farm and for planting things, I plant on the new, just before the new moons, I plant seed. Just before the full moons, I transplant. And those are my basic outlines for working in the garden. So was it always your plan to set up uh, a farm that produced products to sell, or was it just a kind of way that it all grew organically, so to speak? Um, I would say that um, originally we said, OK, we will we'll set up to, to, um, to sell. But then when we got here, we had so much work to do. We, we got to the point where we were self-sufficient and then it's taken off from there and so we started to sell. Now I have quite a, a, a problem with growing 
broccoli plants here and, and generally the cabbage family because um, we have lots of pests here. Because okay, look, I can see there's lots of little bite marks yes. in these leaves here. That's right. That's because most of the um, people opposite who use chemicals also grow brassicas in huge amounts. The bugs aren't silly, they're not going to stay where they're going to get poisoned and sprayed. They come over here and eat them, the nice organic ones. So I grow them in small amounts just for the family. So it's been a lot of hard work, hasn't it? Can yeah. you tell me, has it been worth it? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. The, the, the quality of life, um, you couldn't compare it. The kind of food we eat, the, the kind of life that the kids have, they can get out and they can be out until dark, they don't have to worry. It's, yes, definitely. Organic food production here in Andalusia now accounts for over 50% of Spain's entire output and many small producers are doing their bit to help create a more sustainable future. One man who is pioneering the organic movement here in Andalusia is Mike, who is building a new eco-centre in Soto Grande. I went to meet him and find out about his passion for organic food. These are two Christmas boxes for one of my customers, um, obviously to last a little bit longer with chocolate and, and various things. Oh, I can see the organic Christmas. chocolate. Yes, oh, yes, gosh, I'm, so I'm, organic I'm doesn't mean be... you do without your treats. You still get your chocolate. That's great. Lovely biscuits, Christmas puddings, eggs, aubergines, pepper salads. All the fresh stuff comes from Andalusia, so it's all grown locally. What inspired you to set up this delivery business? Uh, basically, for my family's well-being and my own taste buds. I couldn't find any food when I first got here that tasted as good as it should do and as, as good as I was used to. Um, so my first, my first um, principle was to find good food for the family and so then I realised there'd be hundreds of other people here who felt the same way. So how long have you been here in Andalusia? Been here for just over three years and the business I started a year and a half ago. Well, this is wonderful, but you're not going to just stop here with this business, are you? What are your plans for the future? Well, the demand's enormous um, and there's nowhere that people can drop in and shop because I only deliver and if they forget to order milk then they've still got to not nip down to the supermarket. So the idea is just over here we're going to open a shop with a restaurant um, and there's going to be two treatment rooms in there for health practitioners and a resource centre that helps people with information. So it's been almost like a hypermarket, but for organic and holistic needs. Yes, exactly. Um, so should we go and have a look at yes, it? Come with me. So Mike, this is incredible. It's such a big space and it's so much work to do. There is a lot of work to do. Um, it, I mean, it's what well, you'll see in a moment as we go in. It's a complete building site. And you've got downstairs as well, haven't you? Downstairs is some storage because we're going to continue to deliver to customers who can't come this far down the coast. Mm. So all the storage will happen downstairs. So that sort of gives you an oh, idea. Lovely. So where we're standing here, there will yeah. be tables all the way around the front. Which, which works really well here. So this is it. Gosh, so, you've got so much work to do, haven't you? Uh, there is rather a lot to do. Wow. You have to imagine that this is going to be a beautifully laid out supermarket full of gorgeous food. Now, how long is it going to take you? Um, I'm very optimistic, so I'm hoping it's only going to take two months before we're open. And now, how long have you been working on it so far? Well, it took me seven months to find the right place. Um, and uh, we've been negotiating on the contract and doing all the plans here for, I suppose, about five or six weeks now. Now, obviously, you've done your market research before putting such a huge amount of time and investment into opening this big centre here. Do you think that there's, um, it's, the marketplace is crying out for it now? Absolutely. When I started, my, the first week I started the business, we had 16 customers, and by the end of the third, we had 75. We've now got about 450, um, and they all recommend our services to each, each of their friends, so it's naturally mushrooming. Well, Mike's got his work cut out for him, but we wish him the best of luck and look forward to visiting him again when he's open for business. So this eco-centre is set to become a major attraction here in Soto Grande and will also be a focal point for those wishing to find out how they can also help to create a more sustainable future. Join us next time as we discover more hidden treasures here in alternative Andalusia.